in general, wherever in general, you like to start. Okay. So I was um, in, living in Seattle. I went to the University of Washington. Um, I wanted to take some art classes and somebody told me you better declare an art major because otherwise you're not getting going to get into any of the art classes. Okay, that was fine. So I declared an art major, art major, and I don't know, I think within the year, um, I got interested in textiles, weaving. Um, I did some block printing classes, some screen printing classes, but I really fell in love with weaving. And so probably my third year, my professor said I should take some classes on Northwest Coast Indian art to get some design exposure to, you know, different elements of design. So Bill Holm was teaching th at that time, and I got in on the second, second quarter class, which was sculpture, yeah, three-dimensional art, not the two-dimensional. But because of that, I got really interested in Northwest Coast Indian art. And then the third quarter, I signed up for that class, and it was on the dance and drama part. So, of course, they had the chill cat blankets and, you know, showing that, the dancing and everything. And Bill Holmes said there were hardly any people left who knew how to do the chill cat weaving. There was a woman in Portland, Doris Kyber Gruber and Jenny Planot. And I always say it this way, with all the arrogance of a 22-year-old, I decided I was going to learn chill cat weaving because I was, I loved weaving and I was really interested in Northwest Coast Indian art. And it was like a challenge, but also it's really sad to see something die out. So that's why I decided to learn Chilcat weaving. There was no one to teach me. I had to use books, look at old robes. Cheryl Samuels actually was at the, uh, at the same time and she was also pursuing an interest in Chilcat weaving. And we kind of met up, I don't know, when I was partway through one of the first leggings. There's an independent study project, independent study project. The home ec department had the weaving and the art department had everything else. And I was going to try to get a BFA in textile design, but those two departments just could not get together. And I was not going to wait two more years or whatever it was going to take um, for them to get their act together. So I didn't get that degree, but I got, I got my degree, but just not a BFA. But that was what sparked my interest in weaving. So uh, a side question, the leggings you speak of, are those you, the first leggings you made? Are those the ones that, I'll, I'll let you answer the question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, so when I was up in, I'd heard about Nathan Jackson and I thought he was, the age he is now, but in 1972, I thought he was a really old guy, you know, but I was gonna have a chance to meet him. I was in Anchorage and the museum was having a, a you know, their annual native art show. I think it was the second year. So I met Nathan Jackson and he was not an old guy, <laughs> but um, I ran into, him several times, I think in Juneau, or in, I ran into him at the Alaska State Museum in Juneau, and then again on the ferry between Wrangell and here. Um, I had asked him up in Anchorage, I was doing a trip through Southeast Alaska at the end of the summer, and I asked him where I should be sure to go to see good totem poles, and he recommended some places. So, Kennedy to catch Wrangell and Ketchikan were two of those places. So, I ran into him on the ferry. And we started talking about art and I told him I was going to learn chill cat weaving. And he said, Oh, why don't you make me a pair of leggings and I'll do some of my artwork for you. So yes, that was my first project were those two leggings. Uh, as uh, my, I, I, my first project was a commission. <laughs> so yes. And I've, I've, I've you know, I, I look at them and I feel like they're not anywhere close to what I do now. And, I wanted to, I've wanted to make him a new pair, but he says, no, he wants to keep that pair. <laughs> Understandable. <laughs> so why did you keep weaving? Um, well, Nathan and I got married 
And so, you know, I got, you know, a little more involved in the culture and everything. I love weaving. Oh, and um, also Nathan introduced me to Selena Pradovich, and she invited me to come up. This was that summer when I, we met up on the ferry. And she invited me to come up and take her basket weaving class. I think it was her first class that she was going to teach at the Ketchikan Community College in 1972. And it was perfect for getting into Chilkat because Haidas weave their basket down the warp. And that Chilkat weaving is twined, it's still, it's twining is down the warp. So it was really a perfect introduction for getting going in Chilkat. That's a little side note. Um, I kept weaving because I, I finished, had to, I only had one legging done when Nathan and I got married. And I did the second legging. And then the next year, was the year we got married, um, we were, he was in Sitka doing a Bentwood box class or something. And um, he showed my leggings to Ellen Lang, who was the superintendent at the Sitka Historical National Monument at the time. And she, they commissioned me to do a Chilkat robe. So that was my first big project. So, you know, of course I wove for a year to do that one. I just, I like doing it. I love doing it. I was able, I've been able to teach some um, people how to do it, which is, you know, the whole idea is to not let it die out, right? So I've had some apprentices and they've all, you know, been native women. And so that was good to keep doing that and pass that along. And I, it's very, I don't know, it's rewarding just to see something take shape in front of your eyes. I like that part of it. I'm sure you understand that as a weaver as well, to see the progress. And um, I still want to be able to pass on anything that I know. And there's a lot of Raven's Tale going on right now. Uh, some chill cat, but we want to be sure it doesn't die out. So I do understand that chill cat mm -hmm. itself is hard to comprehend, um, especially for those non-weavers. What did you think about the challenge of doing it without a constant mentor? I, I just did it. Um, I had Emmons book on the chill cat blanket and he is very detailed in how he explained everything and that plus taking Selena's class. Um, sometimes it was trial and error, getting a shape. You know, I had to learn how to do certain things, rip it out, do it again. Um, and actually one of the biggest challenges that came up when I was used doing my robe in Sitka was that my three strand twining just never looked right. I look at the old robes there at the at the park and I'd look at my three strand. It's like, why? I'm doing it exactly the way Emmons says. Why isn't it looking the same? And uh, it was a number of years later, I had started it. At this point, I had started a dance apron and was about an inch into it. And Cheryl Samuel came up to teach a class here in Ketchikan. And she said, I discovered why the three strand twine didn't look right. They always spun, they always did their, all their yarns were Z twist, which is, you know, if you, if you hold a yarn straight up and down, the twist in it either resembles a Z or an S. And all the hand spun yarns were Z twist. All the commercial yarns now are S twist. So when you're doing your weaving, it makes a difference in the final appearance of the, especially the three strand. You can see it in the two strand too, but it's more obvious in the three strand. And I ripped out one inch of 36 inch wide Chilkat dance apron, which was kind of a big apron, but I ripped that out to um, start over again. Cause I tried it and it was like, oh, wow. What, you know. <laughs> What a difference. What a difference. <laughs> yeah, so I ripped it out and started over. So, so I am, go ahead. So the challenge was just, um, and I'm really glad Cheryl did the book because that was something I was never gonna do. 
it's just not the direction I wanted ever to head. And um, the book has really helped a lot of weavers as well. And then she went on to do Raven's Tale. So, yeah, but trying trying to do, learning it without. Well, I had Emmons' book, and Emmons' book is pretty detailed. So that, and then just looking at old robes at the Brook Museum. Well, there you go. So I am grateful to have you as a mentor for me, but I did wonder, did you always intend to pass down these techniques to another generation of weavers? And how has your background impacted that intention? Part of my first project, well, first of all, I just wanted to learn it. It was a challenge. Um, I loved weaving. It was combining two of my interests. When I did the project in Sitka, one of the things that was part of the deal was that I teach somebody. So I had a student when I was in Sitka. And I think it was at that point I realized this is really important to pass this on. And so whenever somebody has approached me to want to learn from me or do an apprenticeship, I've had, I think, three Alaska State, uh, State Council on the Arts apprenticeships. Um, I've done classes at the Totem Heritage Center. I think it's just really important to make sure that this doesn't die out. Um, so whenever I've been asked to teach, I have. Whenever I've been asked for help, I'm happy to give it. For that, I am forever grateful. <laughs> You're a good weaver, you. Stacy. <laughs> Thank you. I do appreciate being able to ask you all my little questions and I'll let you know I was weaving on my chill cat last night and I thought man this is not going as fast as it was in the class no no it takes if you if you step away from it for a while when you get back into it first you have to figure okay where was I mm -hmm. where did I leave off which direction is everything going and then it's like okay like how did I get that shape what am I supposed to do next you know where's my pattern <laughs> So yeah, it's startup is slow again. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. For me, it's where my yarn. But once you get started again, you know, after the first day or so, it picks up. Okay. Okay. Back to our questions. Yeah. <laughs> um, what is the most satisfying aspect of Chill Cat? Getting it finished. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know. Um, Kind of like when Nathan does a totem pole, gets it finished, get it out of here. It's glad it's finished. Um, when I took that last robe I did off the loom, it was like, oh, well, of course that took so long. That was very satisfying to get that finished. But I think every time I finish, I think being able to get a shape just right, like on, on the robe that I did for the Totem Heritage Center, getting that nose just right on the first try was so rewarding <laughs> that I didn't have to rip anything out. Um, I think completing the shape and getting all your ends to the back when you can don't have all these ends flipping up because the you have your three strand braiding horizontally you, you see it and then vertically you don't see it on the back it covers where the two different color yarns join. But then you've got like, you can have 18 ends coming down because each, each color has three strands. And if you've got a yellow one and then black and then three white and then another black and then maybe a blue, you know, you've got all these ends and getting those tucked back behind your weaving and then later sewn up in the back. Um, it's just, it's really a satisfying um, feeling to finish a, a little shape, to finish a little area. So throughout the project, you can have all these little points of great satisfaction that, oh yeah, that's finished and my circle looks nice and the nose came out perfectly on the first try and oh, that eyelid line is really nice. You know, there's just, all kinds of places where it can be really satisfying, you know, 
at you know mid midway through the robe or partway through a project. But I think the best part is getting it off the loom. <laughs> yes, yeah. very satisfying. Um, so we did already talk about your first project. Uh, would you like to tell me about your recently finished um, the robe at the Totem Heritage Center? The robe at the Totem Heritage Heritage Center was commissioned by a museum in Europe. Um, we, Nathan and I were over in Brussels demonstrating. I was working on, I think I was working on his robe at the time. And um, I was commissioned to do one for the, a museum in Europe. And I started, I finished Nathan's in 2001. And then in 2002, I was spinning the warp for this next one and started weaving, I think in 2003. But other things, you know, caught my interest and, you know, I just kind of didn't work on it very diligently like I should have been, although it turned out to be best that I didn't because now then it got to stay here. But, um, and then I started working full time. So, it took 16 years <laughs> to finish that robe. In the meantime, the museum that had commissioned it had been absorbed by another museum. And then that museum bought a new, or built a new building. And by the time I was really ready to start talking, uh, hey, it's almost finished, what's the budget like? Um, they either weren't interested or didn't have budget for new acquisitions, probably especially in Northwest Coast you know, there in Europe. So, um, Anna and Anita at the uh, Heritage was at the Heritage Center at the time, and she was coveting that robe. <laughs> so I'm really happy that it ended up getting to stay here. Took it off the loom in September of 2018. 17 something like that yeah probably 2017 I think <laughs> I'd have to look at my pictures they're all dated but um, yeah I took it off the low blocked it out or took it off the loom blocked it out yeah and we had a little celebration yeah, we had a little, and then, then, then it worked out for the Heritage Center to be able to buy it, or the, you know, Ketchikan Museums to be able to buy it and put it on display at the Totem Heritage Center. And there was a little celebration. That must have been July 2019. Sounds about right. Yeah, because uh, Ashley and the boys were at that, and then the next year they didn't come because of COVID. So, so yeah, that's, it was a long process. Um, the black yarn, because of the mineral content in the yarn, the black is very hard on wool and it kept breaking and breaking and breaking and got very frustrating. And then I ran out of black and had to re-dye some and could never get it quite as black as um, my first batch. It was very, very dark brown, but I kind of like it. And, and if you're really looking, you can see the difference. I've seen lots of old robes with more than one dye lot, you know, multiple dye lots in some cases of the same color. And um, so I'm fine with having that really, really dark brown. And actually, you see that in a lot of old robes, too. So, yeah, that was the frustrating part was my black yarn kept breaking. So I couldn't pull too tight on it. It is uh, a sad moment when your yarn breaks. Yes, yes. Um, what advice do you have for someone who is interested in a student mentor relationship? 
be it chill cat, be it weaving in general, be it, you know, with you or with someone else, what advice do you have for someone who's really looking to take that on? Um, there has to be a commitment because it's not a short process. Um, proximity helps. I've, I've had two apprentices that didn't live here in Ketchikan. Um, sometimes I would go to them, sometimes they would come here. But it's, it's, it's easier if you have close proximity, at least for a good chunk of time. But you can, it's possible to do it without that. Um, you know, I've done it twice. Um, I think commitment Really, it's a it's a time commitment. Whatever whatever uh, aspect of the art you're wanting to learn, and it helps to have a good working relationship with the you know with the, the other part of the equation. Whether if you're the mentor, it helps to have a good relationship with you know obviously with that person. Um, uh, both sides need to be willing to accept correction and criticism. Um, could be the mentor is not explaining things well enough or is too impatient or not clear enough about what needs to be done. The apprentice needs to be able to accept the fact that they might have to do something over, rip something out. Um, but everybody should be kind, you know. It's when you, if, you, if you are making corrections or constructive criticism, it needs to be in a respectful way. So mutual respect um, and commitment for the long haul sometimes. Sometimes it's a long haul. So. That's about all I can think of for that. Yeah. Well. And sometimes the apprentices decide they want to go their own way really earlier than they should. And it's too bad, but the mentor has to, if that's what they want to do, the mentor just has to let them go. You know, if, if they feel like they're done, you can maybe respectfully say, well, you know, this, this, and this, but, you know, you can't force somebody to stay learning from you. So Dorica, mm -hmm. you know, um, this art form was almost gone. You know, we all right. know that it was almost lost forever. And without weavers like you and like your peers and hopefully like me and those before me and after me, the culture that goes with it would also disappear. And I really would like to take the time to thank you for the work that you've done the students that you've taught and the weavers that you have woven beside. It, it truly does mean a lot that you have stuck with this all these years. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm looking forward to continuing weaving. Um, I know there's gals in my last class that have not finished their projects yet. <laughs> <laughs> and, I'm you're not, there. and you're not the only one there's a couple others uh more than a couple others i um you know and that uh, one thing that's been my fault is i sometimes will plan way too an ambitious project for the amount of time the class is set for and also have to realize a lot of the people that take the class have full-time jobs and can't sit there and weave all day in between, you know, the classes. So sometimes I get too ambitious for my students and I know there's a lot of unfinished projects sitting around in people's closets and wherever. I've got this one behind me is, <laughs> well, I, I had another one. This was from my last class. Um, I decided, okay, we're just going to do something small. And I did the same thing 
so that I could kind of stay ahead of the students so I could show them what was coming next. And then this was my second one. So the first one was a circle and then this one was a, is a split U. But it's not finished and my class was, I think I was still working on my robe when, was it? no, my, I guess my robe was finished when I taught my last class. That might have been like March 2019. I thought it was October. Oh, maybe it was the fall. Yeah, October. Your class before that might have been in the. Your yeah, class that, before that was in that February. Was in February when, where that we was had the all fun the storm. Yes, where we had all the snow and had to keep rearranging things. And I was shoveling out yes. water for up to my knees. Yeah. So yeah, I guess that one. The next one was in the fall, and that was that. It might have been 2018 can't remember 2000 I think it was 2018 I'm trying to think when did I get uh, 1099s <laughs> from the city <laughs> so yeah yeah so when classes open back up I I don't know that I would want to teach Chilcat on zoom um so I'm hoping that at some point I'll be able to do in-person class again. And it'll be a let's finish your project class. <laughs> you know, bring your project that's not done and let's get it finished. Well, I'm down to the warp wrapping on the one side, but I wanted to wrap it to the other side that I finished up mm -hmm. the circle and I'm now just in the blue space underneath the circle. And I looked at the first side and I went, wow, there's a lot of blue space to be done. Oh, yeah. Now, are you, you finished the circle, right? Yes. So you just have to do underneath? And then the little, the crescent underneath the blue. Right, right. Um, well, you've got, you're, you're more than halfway, I mean, you know, mm -hmm. the, and you did a crescent on the other side, right? So you know how to do the crescent. So... Ah, it's a snap, the rest of it. It's just putting in the time. And finding my yarn. <laughs> and finding your yarn, yes. And I need to find my yarn to finish this one. You know, they're all safe together somewhere in a little bag. Yeah, yeah, so are mine. I've got a little bit of that dark, dark brown and some white and some of that fading indigo over dyed with wolf moss. So I've been trying to experiment with that to see if I put it in vinegar for a while, if it'll really set the color and keep it from fading out. Because I've still got quite a bit of that color. So it really faded out over the years with my uh, robe at the Heritage Center. So it looks like an old robe, <laughs> even though it's not. <laughs> it's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, I'm I'm happy with it. Although I look at it and go, oh, I should have done this. Oh, that we always do, don't we? Yeah, we're our, actually in the end we're our own worst critics. So, well, thank you, Dorka, for having this interview with me.